from Music for All and presented by Yamaha. It's Mind the Gap, a practical web series for young and future music educators. Tonight on the program, former executive director of Duquesne University's nonprofit leadership institute, Michael Coomer, leader and commander emeritus of the United States Army Band Pershing Zone, Colonel Thomas Palmatier, president of the National Association for Music Education, Dr. Mackie Spradley. Tonight's conversation moderated by Susan Smith. Please welcome Susan Smith. Good evening, and welcome to the 17th episode of Mind the Gap, a webinar series focused on young and new teachers and those student teachers whose experience have been and continue to be interrupted by the pandemic. My name is Susan Smith, and I'm an educational consultant for Music for All and a lecturer in music education at Troy University in Troy, Alabama. I've taught at all levels and areas of music education, and I'm especially interested in supporting young teachers as my daughters are starting their second and fourth years as music educators. My colleague and good friend, David Starnes, director of orchestras at Kennesaw Mountain High School in Cobb County, Georgia, and I have been hosting these since last June and have learned so much from our panelists and look forward to tonight's discussion on, on leadership and making that transition into the profession. I'm so thrilled to have this panel of people with me tonight because they have all impacted me in one way or the other in terms of their leadership and also how they have been such a wonderful example for, for others from working with nonprofits to the commander of the Army Band being a substitute teacher on the side to give back to somebody from Texas being the president of NAFME. Um, all of those things take courage and, and leadership and have they've all experienced the kinds of things that young teachers are experiencing. So I thought they would be great people to talk about these things with our young teachers tonight. We're gonna start off and ask everybody to introduce themselves and then I'm gonna ask them to share a little bit about their leadership experiences as they've been moving forward. So Dr. Spradley, tell us about yourself. Thank you, Susan. Good evening, everyone. Well, as Susan has said, my name is Mackie Spratley, and I uh, live in Austin, Texas. Uh, I'm a Texas girl, I've always lived there. Um, that is good or bad, however you want to think of it, but a Texas girl for sure. Um, I have spent all of my uh, teaching uh, career uh, in the classroom in urban schools. Uh, I began as a um, uh, leader in music ed uh, after I'd been uh, teaching for a number of years and I was a music leader in uh, Dallas Independent School District for 15 years. So I've been in the trenches and I have some war scars and, and I'm anxious to share some of those stories with you tonight. Uh, currently, I work for the Texas Education Agency um, and I am the director of curriculum programs where I oversee the Texas Essential Knowledge and Skills, all of our learning standards for the state of Texas, children with 5.5 million students. Oh my goodness. My interest, my priority is to work diligently to ensure that students have equitable opportunities to experience music education, no matter where there's what their zip code is, no matter where they are, all students deserve and belong in the music classroom. And that is my emphasis. Well, we have never met in person, but we've, we've spent some time on Zooms together and we have connected that way. And I was also there in Washington, D.C. when you gave your, your speech before we voted on president uh, for, for NAFME. And I, I heard you speak and I thought, that's the, that's the person I want to be representing me in Washington, D.C. So uh, we're so thrilled to have you here with us tonight. Mr. Coomer, Michael Coomer, tell us about yourself. Thanks, Susan. Uh, for 15 years, I was the uh, Dean of School of Music here in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, Duquesne University, a school that for well over three decades now has had a magnificent music education department led by a succession of fantastic music educator leaders, uh, unbelievable faculty members. Um, during that period of time, experienced uh, 
absolutely unbelievable students who gave presentations at regional and national conventions, just did uh, an incredible job. Um, my own background is that uh, I'm a recovering drummer. And so, you know, we're going to be in big trouble tonight in terms of addressing questions that you present and that people call in with. So we are just going to have a wonderful time and looking forward to participating in tonight's panel discussion. Thanks, Susan. Yeah, thank you so much for being here with us. Tom Palmatier, you're all, you said it's snowing where you are. Tell it is. Where. I'm in beautiful Evergreen, Colorado. It's a mountain town just to the west of Denver. And uh, as Susan said, I, uh, I, when I uh, finished with the Army, I was leader and commander of the United States Army Band Purging Zone. I was a soldier for nearly 37 years and 22 years in command. Um, and, and now I am an active music educator once again. And I just realized looking at the camera, I'm still wearing my badge from today. I taught um, K through five music today. So I did some, did some work with ORF instruments today. Um, <clears throat> you know, uh, obviously the U.S. Army puts an awful lot of energy and resources into training its leaders. So I've had probably... Uh, I've had a significant amount of leadership instruction throughout culminating as a graduate of the Army War College. Um, but, but particularly with the 22 years in command with uh, time in six combat zones, you kind of learn what you're about as a leader and you, and you learn what your, your soldiers, and in this case, all those soldiers were musicians. So I was leading fellow musicians as well as fellow soldiers. So, and, and now I get the chance to, um, to uh, teach in a classroom very, very regularly, but also to spend a lot of time um, mentoring a, a whole a bunch of young educators on just what we're gonna talk about here tonight on, on how to become not just better educators, better conductors, but better leaders as well. I, I remember doing a session of Music for All last summer, I guess it was, before the pandemic about leadership. And there you walk in and I'm like, oh my. <laughs> you talk about it, oh, what am I gonna tell this guy about leadership? But as I said, each of you have given back in, in so many ways. It's, it's just, it's thrilling to have you here with us tonight. We're gonna take just a minute and go around the table. And I've asked each of our panelists to think about two things they wish that someone maybe had told them or they maybe had listened to a little bit more or knew about as a young educators, they were coming out in, in terms of leadership, things that meant something to them or something that they wish that even they had paid a little bit more attention to moving forward. And we'll just again, go, go around the room. Mackie, you wanna start us off? Well, I'm going to start us off with something that will, um, it's like walking into a beehive um, because as a leader for me, and this is from my personal experience, I wish someone had told me that it was um, that who you know becomes much more important than what you know. Uh, the, um, the social capital that many of us, when we go into education, we, spent, we spend years trying to earn that, that social capital to climb the ladder or to get to some place that we think we want to be. It takes a lot of our energy. It takes, takes a lot of our time. It, it saps, our, saps us emotionally and spiritually. And so um, spending time to, to get to that place, sometimes you can't get there if the structure in which you get there is more about who you know rather than what you know. I think I would have saved, my saved myself some headaches I would have saved. I would have saved myself um, of stress and anxiety and frustration, and uh, feeling that I made mistakes or crying or, oh, I, I'm really taking us way down into the bi, right? But it, it's a real story for me, so I can give my experience, and hopefully there will be someone who listens 
um, to this at some point in some time and say, okay, I understand that, or yes, that makes sense for me because that is maybe similar to what I'm going through. So that's Absolutely. one I don't need to share anymore. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and I think that's the, the toughest thing sometimes for our collegiates is they think that, you know, we never made mistakes. So we've made all of these mistakes. And to be able to see someone who has, has done those things is, is, is powerful to them for sure. Thank you so much. Michael, what are some things you'd like to share? Sure. Susan, when you introduce this exercise, you use the expression, paid attention to. So I'm going to use that as a kickoff for this little story. Uh, if anybody listening to this has ever gone to a, a music conference or maybe the Music for All Summer Symposium, I want you to imagine what it's like trying to have a one-on-one -on -one conversation. Uh, for example, if you're in the middle of the exhibit area and you know what a beehive of activity that is. So you're trying to have that one-on-one -on -one conversation and there are distractions all over. And so what happens is that the temptation is to go like this. You know, you're looking around and you're looking around when that person is immediately in front of you. Now, all too often, especially when I was younger, although I have to confess, this still happens to me, I had that experience well, I was distracted while trying to focus or not really being successful at focusing on that child who was in front of me at that time. And when that happens, that child is forming some opinions. One opinion is, of course, that I'm inauthentic. Another opinion is that he or she, that child, isn't very important. So that child is feeling like, oh, he or she is small and insignificant whenever I'm distracted and not paying full attention to him or her. Because, you know, when he or she comes up to me, that may be the most important in that child's day. And if I'm not pulling full attention, if I'm not putting full attention in that conversation with that child, in that moment, then I'm blowing it. And that is absolutely the worst thing that I could possibly do. And in terms of leadership, I can't tell you the number of times that that is a huge mistake that I made. And boy, would I love more than anything else to be able to redo that experience. So there you go. Mm. I'm reminded how sometimes at convention, we see this at Midwest, you know, you're shaking hands with somebody and they're always looking to see if there's somebody better to see behind you, you know, who do they, or, or, or they're looking at your tag to see, and you're not in that moment in genuine. Absolutely. Great, yeah. wonderful, wonderful advice. Tom? Well, I, I think I would say um, self-knowledge, getting to know, really know yourself. And having said that, that sounds easy, but I'm, uh, I'm 66 and I'm still on that quest for sure. Uh, I, and I think every, everybody is. There are, are at least three of you or me or anyone else. There's the, the true self. There's the self that we think we are. And then there's the self that others perceive us to be. And there may be even more. And um, the closer that you can get those three selves aligned, the happier and more successful you'll be. And, and that's why when I'm working with, with young um, aspiring leaders, uh, the first book we always start with is a book called Who Would Want to Be Led By, or Why Would Anyone Want to Be Led By You? And the central premise of that book is um, kind of figuring out just who you are, and that then allows you to figure out uh, who how to present yourself to others in, in a way that's genuine uh, so that you're not, you're not creating a facade, but you know, you're, you're, you're actually revealing parts of yourself that are truly you, but you've got to know who you are, who you is. I, that was quite a grammatic turn of phrase. Uh, uh, so I think, you know, trying your best to have self knowledge and to align those multiple selves to be as close as possible. And the second one is to, to have an, under, an underlying value to what you do. 
because you know the organizations, the people that are successful for long periods of time are those that have a set of values that st stay pretty solid throughout their lives. So, you know, the, the first thing when I talk about values with young leaders, I would say, why are you doing this? Why are you in this profession? If you are in this profession because you truly in your soul believe that, that music makes young people be more successful and happier in life, and you have a calling to help them find that, then that's pretty cool. If you are in there because you are really, really, you, you want to be the person getting the first place cup from this competition and that sort of thing, um, I, I can't argue with that, but I'm not sure that that's a value that is gonna guide you throughout your entire life in a healthy and happy way. So have a self-knowledge and then have, have a guiding, principle or a guiding value that is going to be your anchor because tough times are going to come. Challenges are going to come. You're going to want to quit. You're going to want to do something. You're, you're going to question if you have it, if you belong in this profession. And so you, you need to know why you're there. <clears throat> Excellent. Well, one of the things I talk about with my students and we wanted to kind of start things off with tonight is you know, in college, up to this point, we've pretty much been a dependent. Someone has claimed us on their taxes and someone else has always told us what to do. We had this discussion today about you're going to miss this structure and you're going to miss this, this people telling you what to do because all of a sudden you're out there, you're what you want to be all of a sudden, and nobody's really telling you the how to do it and how to lead yourself. And, and I think that creates a lot of insecurity for, for young educators. And that's part of our, you know, trying to keep them from getting burned out or and staying in in what it is that we do so so any words of advice or how to deal with those insecurities and in those first steps of taking that first job and and getting out into the workplace Mackie you want to jump off there or um, as many uh, young teachers that I have uh, interviewed you know I've seen it over and over and over they're they're kind of two kinds if you want to think of it that way um, there are those who are very, very confident in what they have done and where they have been. Maybe their school program was really great. They went to a great university and they did extremely well, well there. And so they've gone through their student teaching. And when they interview there, it's almost as if they're expecting to automatically go into that new school or a school in which someone just left where the students love that person, and they're going to automatically have the same uh, experience and be able to recreate some of those things that they had when they were in school. And when that doesn't happen, that causes a great deal of frustration. Um, they can't, you know, I tried this, I know that my, my students, when I was in school, we sang this song, it was great, but you only have three sopranos, <laughs> you have five altos, you have one, one tenor, and you know, three or four guys in the back, they don't, their voice, well, no. So you can't do that song, you know? Um, and that causes a person to, to scramble, you know, they don't know where to go. They, they become very frustrated. So one of the things that I normally try to say to them um, or create for them is a space in which um, all of them can come together and talk about those experiences, to be in a reflective group where they can go through uh, what lessons they want to teach and how they want to teach it. More than anything, there has to be that, that network, that um, mentoring group, but it's within each other, you know, within the group itself. I've found that when you throw a young teacher to a mentor, they don't, you know, it doesn't always work. And we're still we're still trying to go down that path of, 
of coming up with that model for mentoring teachers. And I don't think we've absolutely found it because most musicians at a school are singletons, you know, and so your mentor is at XYZ school. So the insecurities just creating creating some kind of network in which students with like minds and like experiences can share among themselves. Absolutely. Yeah, that we don't quite know what to do and something doesn't work. So all of a sudden we feel like maybe, you know, that confidence dips and, and that imposter syndrome thing right. kind of comes about and, and how we combat that. Michael, do you have some words? Oh, absolutely. And I want to hitchhike on what Mackie was saying because there was <laughs> Mackie, there was so much wisdom there. I could probably talk for an hour and a half picking up those themes that you were introducing, but I'm just going to focus on one element of it. And well, first of all, just a postscript uh, to what you said, and that is I'm the oldest one here in the group. And I will tell you right now, I'm still insecure. And, and so that, that never changes, you know, that if you think there's going to be a point where that security is going to change, you know, when you start with any kind of a performance and being in a classroom is a performance. I'll tell you what, give me the secret of your success because I could use a lot of it right now. <laughs> okay. But I'll tell you what, other than that, uh, picking up another thing, of Mackey's is I want to talk about the word mistake because part of that insecurity is linked to making mistakes. And, and, and we think about mistakes ordinarily or predominantly as the kind of mistakes we might make when we're playing our instrument and you know we miss a note or something like that. But I want to redefine mistake. And I want to talk about the kind of a mistake that happens when you're on a soundstage and you're producing a movie. And I want you to imagine that you're director of the movie. And if you're the director of the movie, movie, I, you know, you, as a director of the movie, you'll say, take one, and then you'll say, take two or take three. And so you'll do a number of takes of a particular scene until you get it right. Now, nobody thinks or has a second thought about doing a number of takes, but I want you to think about this. Every time you do a take and then you do it over and over and over, it's a miss take, only now it's hyphenated. It's a mistake. Well, nobody gets upset about it. Nobody gets uptight about it. They think we're just going to do it over again until we get the take right. And so I want you to think about uh, every time you go into a classroom and something doesn't go as beautifully as you want it to, it's simply a miss hyphen take. And so you simply do the take over again. And if you think about it in that context, it changes completely the way you think about what is a, right now, a mistake. And you put that hyphen in there and you think, oh, it's a miss take. So we're just going to do the take over again until we get it right. And it's no different than what happens when a movie director is putting a film together and is working on that scene with actors until they get it right. And they just do a number of takes. So I'll let it go with that. And Susan, you just want to move on to Tom and let's see what we can come up with. Well, even for context, you know, when I talked to you about doing this, you said, oh, I wouldn't have anything to give. I, I couldn't possibly be. <laughs> so we all have apprehensions moving forward, but here we are. And we're so thankful that you are here. Tom, what about those those first steps? Well, you know, first off, let's talk about insecurities because, you know, I'm, I'm doing the Alabama All-State Band next week and I'm terrified, you know. <laughs> but, you know, I'm, I'm sure we're going to make great music together. But, no, I mean, it, it doesn't matter how many accolades and things you have. Uh, you still go into every single setting hoping and that you can do the very best you can do. And that's all we're trying to do. Mackie said something that, that I've, I've never thought about before, but I think it's right. And then, and it's not, and then I'll get back to your topic about the idea of mentorship and that with a, a br brand new ter person, um, I've occasionally had the opportunity to have them say, would, would you be my mentor? And I find it to be a little frustrating when they're brand new like that, because I think you're exactly right. They kind of need to form their own posse first. 
and to learn. And I almost said to one of them, you don't know enough to be mentored yet. You know, you, you haven't made enough mistakes for, to, to find out. So I, I just I, I, that may be something to consider as we look at mentorship programs that maybe uh, the brand new teacher is not necessarily the target. Maybe it's the second year teacher should be the target of our mentorship efforts. Let, let them learn on their own for, and, and, and then we'll try to help them. Anyway, so back to the, the topic. Um, you know, co- true confidence comes, comes from competence. And I, you know, so I think all you can do as a, as a young person is just trying to keep filling up your toolbox for things like the, the couple of dozen uh, people who are joining us online here. And I, I, I'm sure that many more will watch the recording later. Um, you know, you've just, you're, you're in a constant uh, trek to fill in your knowledge gaps. Mm-hmm. And to this point in college, you probably did, you probably got this much leadership training, none at all. Uh, and yet, you know, in, in the army, by the time someone takes command of their first company, they have had five or six years of in-depth, hands-on leadership training and courses and all kinds of stuff. And yet we take somebody with a bachelor's degree in music that have had all their focus on playing clarinet or something and throw them into a classroom and just assume that they need know how to be leaders when in fact you can learn how to be a leader. There's, I mean, you, you just get in there and you, you find good books to read. You, you, you go to, you participate in things like this because you have to build enough confidence. You, you, you get the confidence so that you build enough confidence so that you then have the resiliency. So when you fail, which you will, you, you have enough confidence yourself to pick yourself up and go back at it again and just try again and try again and try again. I mean, that's what resiliency is. It's just picking yourself up after you fail. But if you don't, if you have not built up the competence, if you have not tried your best to fill up your toolbox, when you get knocked down again, you might just say, well, I'm out. And uh, that would be a terrible shame. As we transition into that professionalism, uh, I I think one of the, the big things is this idea of getting things done, checking things off to getting it done well or completely. Um, I'm one of my favorite, my best student teachers, you know, I was district chairman and we had to do the program and he, he did it and sent it to me and said, I think it's done. And I sent it back to him probably five or six more times where things weren't right. Um, and just having that level of completion versus it being done correctly, I think is one of the transitions to that professional life. Um, and there's other things, demeanor that, that looks like a teacher or that person speaks like a teacher is a professional in that way. What are some tips or things that you can think of that, that you would love to, to share with our, our, our group here about, about making that transition? Mackie, we'll go back with you again. I think for the teachers that I've worked with over um, my career, that was one of the most difficult things for the teacher. Um, they could teach the music and, but it was, it was all of the, that extra stuff that we don't really address at all in music ed classes in methods or we don't, we don't say, um, that you're going to be working in a school and the school is an institution that has all that, that they have all of these other requirements that you have to complete. In addition to that, you're working in another system, which is the the music uh, region or, you know, you you have all of these wraparound organizations that you have to fulfill requirements in. And I have seen teachers just be overwhelmed with those things because it's so much to get uh, completed. For example, uh, transportation, when you, uh, and I hate to say this, in Dallas ISD, to do transportation for one bus, the, the stack of papers may be this, this thick. I mean, that do, no longer exists, you know, and I'm grateful for that. But so one of the things that planning, give you a calendar, plan things out, 
take the dates that you're going to need for all of your events, plan those out, always pad in days to get things completed. Uh, and I know Kim and Chris are on this call, so they cannot listen to anything I'm saying right now. They need to do this because I'm not doing this right now as president. <laughs> but all of that lead in time so that you're not waiting to the last minute to get things completed. And you actually have the time to go back, look through all of the instructions, make sure that you have followed all of those instructions to the T, get an opportunity to proofread, even in emails. You know, emails have, we do everything through technology. And uh, I know young folks can do things very quickly, but checking the email, checking the tone of the email, checking um, who the email, who is copied on the email, uh, the intention of the email, just, you know, having uh, practices that they create themselves to make sure that they're doing things uh, right. If I did an email, I'd always have another colleague, especially if I was upset. Okay, you need to read this because I feel a little bit off right now. And I may not have <laughs> written this correctly, you know, in a way that it should be written. So uh, having someone to kind of uh, help you along the way. Excellent. Trying to unmute there. I, my daughter's first football game, it was an away game. And, uh, you know, we all want the band to be great and everything. But those buses came around the corner into that stadium. And I was just in tears, not because it was her first game, but I knew she knew how to fill out the paperwork. And the, and the bus had come. And I was so proud in that moment. It's those details and the, yeah. that can lead us to that professionalism. Do you agree, Michael? Yeah, you know what, I, I do agree. And on one hand, I'm thinking about the kind of mastery uh, represented by Mackie and Tom and Susan. And I think you, you've just got to watch those people and the way the three of you model that kind of behavior. And if I'm a young teacher, I just want to, you know, sit at, you know, the base of the throne for all three of you and just you know, watch what you do, model your behavior as much as possible, knowing that it's going to take years and years and years uh, of just practice, practice, practice before I can have any hope of reaching that exalted level of artistry in the classroom. At the same time, there is something that I'm going to be able to contribute from the first day that I'm in the classroom. It's a different kind of mastery. It's the mastery that I started developing at the moment I came out of the womb because I was in the presence of, in many cases, in many cases, some loving parents perhaps. I might have been in the presence of some great educators starting in first grade. I may have been in the presence of some really great um, uh, uh, people surrounding me. It could have been in my local church or uh, you know, synagogue or temple or whatever. And so I may have been around people who were models for me of a different kind. And that is they may have been models for love. They may have been models for caring. Uh, they may have been models uh, for people who were sincere. Uh, they may have been models for all those kinds of attitudes, positive attitudes. And so when I go into a classroom, that first classroom, there are some ways I can model excellence isn't necessarily going to be in the techniques of music education. It's not going to be that kind of mastery, but it may be attitudinal mastery. So why don't I think about bringing attitudinal mastery into the classroom while I'm developing my uh, musical and music educational mastery, which is going to take a while. It's going to take a long while uh, to develop that musical education mastery. 
but there are other kinds of mastery that I've been developing my entire life that I can bring into the classroom immediately and absolutely transfer that to those children and make that magic happen from the moment I step into that classroom. So over to you, Susan. <laughs> Thanks. Well, that idea of respect and being respectful, um, I think, is a key component to leadership. And Tom, obviously, you have to had to deal with that a lot in the military and and how you bring those um, those approaches to the table in terms of leadership in our music programs. Sure. Uh, and, and that has changed hugely during my professional career. And certainly, you know, I, I mean, when I was in the New York All-State Band, the director was William Ravelli. And every rehearsal had to end with several people crying or it was a failed rehearsal, you know, <laughs> and, and my, and my high school band director practiced that way. And, and so guess what? When I started off as a band new, brand new army bandmaster, that was my leadership style. And uh, it, luckily I evolved, luckily for those people who worked for me, uh, I evolved and found out that respect is a lot better motivator than fear. Um, but uh, it, it, back to, to the topic, but thanks for setting that up, Michael, because you're exactly right. If, if people fear and dislike you, they won't make music with you. Mm -hmm. um, but one of the, 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 the lessons that I would always give young officers who would come to work for me, and I had dozens, frankly, because I kind of became, that kind of became my thing is training new executive officers. So they would send me all the, 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 new, the new guys to, to train. And I found that just like young teachers who are anxious to now be in charge and to be able to set their own priorities and to kind of be a big shot, uh, we all work for somebody. And the, the lesson that I had to kind of um, uh, impart to the young officers and sometimes, you know, uh, figuratively beat into them was that your boss's prior your boss's priority becomes your number one priority. Your boss's number ten priority is your number one priority. Take care of your boss's stuff first, because then you are free to take care of your stuff. And and if you make a habit of that, that when your boss asks you to do something. Take care of it. And as you said, do it right. Don't just check the box. Do it right so that so that your boss can hold it up and say, that's what I want from the rest of you folks. If you can do that, you will then earn the independence that you really are, are that you are striving for. Because if your boss starts seeing you as the, the go to person that will take care of things, do it right the first time, get it done, get it off the plate then they will view you as one of the go-to people and they will, go, they will spend their attention on other people who are not the go-to people. That allows you the maximum freedom to do your thing. When I was uh, in charge of the Army School of Music, uh, my title wasn't Dean, but basically I was the Dean. I, one time on a stretch, I did not hear from my boss for two months. And I was starting to get a little worried. So I got in touch with their, um, their, their assistant, said, hey, uh, I haven't heard from the boss in a couple of months. Is everything OK? Am I in trouble? And they said, no, 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 no. You're, you're, you're one of the good ones. She doesn't have to bother you. <laughs> so I said, OK, good. <clears throat> so that's, I think that's job one, because you know when we get those requirements from the next level, we may not see them as being important. And, and we may not, they may not be important. But we certainly are in a position to, to, to judge whether or not they're important. Get it done. Get it off your plate. Get it off their plate. Move on. The second or the other one is very cosmetic, but I always talk with uh, graduating college students about it. Think about TV and movies when they want someone, and I'll say especially a young woman, to appear to be uncultured or cheap. What do they do? They have them chew gum. So I tell young teachers, never, ever, ever chew gum. Because that's the quickest way that Hollywood has decided. I mean, I saw this movie once with Sandra Bullock, America's Sweetheart, is just, you know, she's being Sandra Bullock. But then they wanted her to, uh, basically, she was pretending she was a prostitute. 
the only thing they had her do was chew gum. And said, so, so please, 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 as young people, do not chew gum because it's the quickest way for you to appear to be unsophisticated. There you go. I'm in trouble for sure. <laughs> I, I, I chew gum to keep from eating other stuff for sure. <laughs> but to keep me busy. Well, we're going to go to a couple of questions here real quick. We'll use this as a transition. Thank you, Rachel Harbin. For, um, she asked, what habits can young and new teachers begin developing from day one to heighten their chances of success within the classroom and school system? And we'll just open this up. We can just jump at it if, if you have some thoughts on that. Early is on time, on time is late. Yeah. Try to find opportunities to observe great teachers. Mm. and take as many notes and, you know, try to become a sponge. And you can look and observe more than one. Absolutely. We are, we are defined by the company we keep. Mm -hmm. uh, so you want to surround yourself by the best people. Um, this is tough. This is really tough. Um, examine the kind of people you hang out with and say, uh, are, are, are these the people that kind of reflect my own values and so on? Uh, even when you go to music conferences, you want to say to yourself, I want to shadow the best of the best of the best, not only in the clinics that I go to, but after I hear Mackie give a clinic, I'm going to go pester her and I'm going to say, Mackie, uh, can I have coffee with you? Can I have lunch with you? Mackie, I got to apologize because you're going to have 200 people wanting to have lunch with you. I can tell you right now, but that's the way you build up uh, your, your own persona by spending time with the best who are out there. So enough of that. Oh. In, in 1967, my band director said, and he only said it one time, and it has been, it has stuck with me since then as the most profound thing I'd ever heard. Small people talk about people. Oh. Medi medium people talk about things. Big people talk about ideas. Yeah. So the, the, the less, whenever you find yourself talking about people, say, how can I be a bigger person? Because yeah. that, that is a, that, that spreads quickly yeah. if you're talking and, and particularly, you can never, ever, ever, under any circumstances, even with the most trusted friend, ever say anything bad about your boss, mm -hmm. ever. It will get back to them, and, you, and that will follow you for, for, it could follow you for the rest of your career, or in some cases, if you have a vindictive boss, it could end your career. Excellent. Absolutely. And I think for social media, especially, we get kind of desensitized about that. But you'll, if you just notice the people that always say, so, if they're on social media, saying something uplifting or something to help people or promote an idea as opposed to trying to tear down other things, um, I think that you'll, you'll see a real professional. I think that that's, that's something that's very important. All those are Wonderful. Let's let's go to another one. Have any of you ever experienced imposter syndrome? How do you focus on focusing, closing your knowledge gaps if you're experiencing guilt or of not already not knowing something? <laughs> How do you focus on those things? How do you go find the information? One of the things that I would do early on in my career would be I, I would buy every book that I could get my hands on that I thought would help me. And I read like crazy. Um, a, a, you know, you don't get it all in the classroom, regardless to how great your school is. And I, I graduated from the University of North Texas. It, great music school, I mean, undeniable. But you don't get it all in the classroom. So I read every book, I, um, I asked friends, who I knew were great teachers, what books would you recommend? Uh, I read those books, took notes, and that helped me get out of, you know, faking it until I make it, you know? Mm -hmm. But, you know, sometimes faking it until you make it, you know, it can, it can get you to a place, but it can't, it can't, it cannot take the space of the knowledge, really 
having the knowledge because when you have the knowledge, you can think through things, you can uh, transfer it, you can apply it in different ways. And, and that, I think that that's a, a, a greater benefit to you. At least it was for me. Yeah. Uh, Tom, I'm going to ask you to go next because I, I'm still processing this one. Now. <laughs> sure. Um, God, yes, the answer is yes for uh, experiencing imposter syndrome, without a doubt. Um, and I, you know, I had an instance when I was a, a actually, I, was, I think I was a major, so I was pretty well along in my career and, and commanding uh, one of the Army's larger bands. And, you know, uh, I think conductors and uh, well, educators who are also conductors and that they're, they're not always the same group of people, yeah. but, they, uh, but they are overlapping skills, certainly. And if you are a conductor, oftentimes we forget about the fact that we are, are rank beginners. You know, if you think about yourself, when you graduate from college, you probably played your major instrument for 10, 15 years, and you spent four hours a day in a practice room. And then I say, how long have you been conducting? Well, about three weeks. And how, and how much do, do you practice a week? And it's, well, I don't. So, okay, you're still in the Rubank elementary phase as a, as a conductor. And that, that insecurity follows you the rest of your, your life, frankly, because, and, and I certainly experience that when, when I'm conducting the U.S. Army Band, when I've got the world's finest musicians in front of you, you're just going, I, I just hope I can keep up. But I, I experienced something uh, about midway through my career that almost uh, it, 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 it shook me to the core. I went to uh, University of North Texas this summer uh, conducting symposium, affectionately known by a lot of people as Camp Corporon. Mm -hmm. And I came back all thinking that, oh man, I'm, I'm just going to be so great now that this band is just, they're all going to give me a standing ovation at the first rehearsal. So I went into that first rehearsal and it was a bad rehearsal. It probably had nothing at all to do with me. I mean, we, we overestimate our impact on ensembles as conductors. It probably was just a bad day for the band, but I was shook to the core to the point where I handed off rehearsals, concerts, to everything to my deputy uh, as long as I could. I, I, was, I was afraid to get back on a podium. Mm -hmm. And a big concert was coming up and it was a big enough one that I was unable to pawn it off on this poor Lieutenant. Um, so I just had to go in and spend hours and hours and hours at, at the end of the day in front of a mirror, standing on a podium, just kind of rebuilding the confidence and getting back on the horse and saying, and then for that first rehearsal after that, just saying, you get, whether or not you think you can do it, you got to do it. And it turned in, it was a pretty good rehearsal. I'm sure it was just happened that the band had a better day that day. So, um, so imposter syndrome, yes. And it doesn't necessarily just happen at the beginning of your career. You, you're going to hit hurdles mid-career later on where you're just kind of going, uh-oh, I'm in over my head. And all you can do is just kind of, I'll call it the equivalent of hit the books. Whatever, whatever, whatever knowledge gap you ran into, you've just got to go fill that gap in so that you can jump back into it and hopefully be successful. Well, there's so many resources available now. Uh, you know, we, we talk about this internet, but you could just literally Google a YouTube on how to, you know, finger this on this instrument or what, and, and they might not all be the, the best uh, example, but there'd be something for sure. And, and that there's so many resources to just be able to find those. But, but Tom, you bring up a good point. I mean, to, to that's leadership because you're showing your vulnerability and, and, and that in, in terms of things that you had to kind of overcome and a hurdle, and it's not always easy. And I think that that's something to model for people as well, that for students. Um, not, just not very global here, but uh, what do you think will be the lasting effects of the pandemic on our profession? Boy, that's that's a lot. We're, we are, um, obviously, we were already affected in many ways. And, and, um, and Mackie, you, you deal with this on a daily basis because we're trying to now force, see into the future what music instruction is going to look like moving forward. Do you have some thoughts? 
I do. I, I am hopeful that music education will not go back to where it was before. I am hoping that we will not try to recreate the same models that we've used before because actually I think what we've learned in this process is that has been in many ways a disservice to our students because not many of them have had the opportunity to improvise, to compose, to listen longer, or to have um, more one-on-one -on -one or uh, group um, work. And what the pandemic has done is reframed how we engage students and what we do with students um, rather than um, start at the beginning of a piece and play it from the beginning to the end and then start at the beginning and play it to the beginning and the end and have those eight to 10 songs that we rehearse from the beginning of school until halfway through the school year. Um, I think it is, it helps our students if they actually learn skills in a way that they can critically think through what they're doing, that they can become the musician as they pick up the music, that they can um, um, understand what they're looking at, they can make music out of it and make those choices themselves. Um, I think we, we build a stronger community of long um, life, long, I'm sorry, lifelong musicians. So they don't have to get up and, and oh, I remember the fight song. I'm gonna play the fight song, da da da, you know, but they can play something else. And uh, I'm hoping that that will, that the pandemic will change for long-term some of the things that we have done in the classroom. Yeah. Anybody else wanna jump in on that one? Yeah, I'm going to jump in now. But Susan, I'm going to connect that to the question I didn't get a chance to answer a few minutes ago about information. So I think I'm finally ready to jump in. <laughs> um, look, Mackie just answered a question brilliantly about the pandemic, but I don't think she answered it on the basis of information. So she transcended information and she answered it on the basis of insight intuition and wisdom. And so while information may have been something that supported her answer, there was so much more that went into her answer. So it's, she didn't base it only on information. Information can become kind of a crutch that many of us utilize. And we're into an information-based society. And sometimes we're overwhelmed with information. And so information, like I said, can sometimes become something that holds us back. Uh, Tom, the story you told, I just thought was so uh, elegant. And the story you told, I thought was magnificent, because there were so many uh, lessons of leadership in that story. And those lessons of leadership really were some of the things that overcame information. And there were elements of leadership in your personality that weren't information based that allowed you to overcome that challenge that you had. And I love that. I thought it was great. Susan, uh, all the communication I've had with you that allowed your personality to shine, even in the way you've moderated today's program, while there's information that supported that, there is so much more that surfaced. So information is kind of maybe a foundation to what we do, but there's energy, there's enthusiasm, there is so much more. And so we don't want to become information reliant, uh, even overcoming the pandemic, which Mackie, you just talked about brilliantly. Uh, and I agree with everything you just said. We just don't want to simply allow information, especially which doesn't exist in terms of uh, overcoming the pandemic, in terms of music education, to allow us to be paralyzed in terms of what we know we can do 
in order to take the pandemic and notwithstanding the tragedies that have occurred uh, and loss of life that's been so terrible, uh, the pandemic is going to create a breakthrough in many ways in the way we teach music. So, yeah, let's let's go and, and use the kind of things, Mackie, you talked about and allow permanent uh, advances in music education to take place. Thanks, Susan. Yeah, I, I agree completely there. I, I've seen um, two approaches by music educators here locally. Um, I'll, I'll say the the really good ones once they got over the shock of okay we're not going to have this uh, yeah. they focused on on individual student skills and teaching the student how to practice how to learn how to how to self teach yeah. and and got uh, and we're seeing they were seeing great progress and getting a lot of satisfaction really getting back to teaching if you will. Uh, so, uh, the, the, but then, of course, there were others who just said, okay, well, it's not what I'm used to having. I'm just going to kind of give up. And, and they've, they've showed a lot of Disney videos and, um, uh, you know, just used a lot of worksheets and things like that uh, under the guise of teaching theory, but uh, d didn't, keep pe didn't keep students making music as much as they could. Uh, so I think we are going to have somewhat of a lost year for some students. Mm -hmm. We're going to have a lost year of, of practice, if you will, of being, uh, of working with an ensemble. I, I don't think that's a terrible, that, that can be filled in, that can be made up. Uh, what has been, as Mackie, you didn't quite say it as explicitly as, as I was thinking it, but at least in the, well, in in the ensemble world, uh, competitions and festivals um, ruled the roost in a lot of places and became the total focus at the expense of teaching, at the expense of music making, at the expense of music education. Um, and I think all of us are ho hopeful that it, that I've talked with a number of teachers who said, it was so awesome not to have to worry about festival. It was so great not to have to do marching band competitions. We just, you know, we just did stuff that, that made sense to the kids. And I hope that uh, the directors will have the courage and that their administration will allow us to learn those lessons that competitions and festivals and ratings are not the only way of um, measuring success in music, so. It's amazing how all of a sudden a standards-based education has been very helpful and to have a, a set of national and state standards to what we should be teaching in the music classroom as opposed to maybe just the title of our ensemble um, all of a sudden has, has become very important in, in these days. I think, it's, I think it's a pivotal year for sure in many ways and, and we can be positive moving forward uh, and, and or not. And I, and I think all of us choose to, to be positive and use it in the best way possible. We're going to close things out by just any, again, words of wisdom in terms of how to stay motivated and how to avoid that burnout and how to, to know that what we do has an impact on children and, and the lives of there's not just as music makers, but as, as humans moving, moving forward. Mackie, you want to kind of last words? Um, I guess my very last words would, would be uh, to take time for yourself, focus on yourself spend some time alone with yourself. Uh, center yourself before you go to work. Uh, center yourself uh, several times during the day. Um, you might have to do it between period four and period six, you know, depending on the day. Uh, because that is what helps you uh, to maintain your energy, to maintain a collect, uh, collective thought about where you want to go. And it helps you not to become fried or frayed by um, elements that happen during the day. It'll help you experience less anxiety. 
Um, and, you know, taking care, care of ourselves is one of the most important things that we can do because we can't give to others if we have, um, if we're so damaged that um, we, we, we're just not able to. And that, that is when we experience burnout, when we're trying to give from where we don't have the capacity to give. Awesome. Michael? Yeah, um, burnout is jargon. Uh, in some cases, it may mean that you're in the wrong job, but I think in many more cases, it may mean that something's going on. It may mean that something's going on in terms of uh, stress, or depression, something's going on in your life outside of the job. And you may want to take a look at that, talk to somebody, see what's happening. And uh, so anyway, I, I, I think we need to eliminate the phrase burnout because it can cover up a multitude of things that can be happening inside of us yeah. uh, that, are, that are blocking us from realizing our full potential. Excellent. Thank you. Tom? I have a self-improvement program and, and not just, uh, not just music methods, not just, you know, uh, and have an achievable program and, and include in that physical fitness. If you think about the people who have been, who are successful, who you admire, it's very rare to find one of those people who is, you know, um, uh, 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 abuses alcohol and drugs, is a heavy smoker, is really overweight. Generally, you look at the people who are successful for decades, they really take good care of themselves physically, but they also never stop learning. So, you know, I have a, a, a realistic self-improvement plan. And, you know, I, I'm putting up in the chat, um, I, I, I have a, a, a little presentation that I have on my website called How to Succeed at Your First Job. And self-improvement is one of the three pillars of that. And if any of the attendees, after looking through that, want to get in touch with me, I'd be happy to set up a one-on-one -on -one to kind of go through that presentation because uh, it talks about culture and self-improvement as as very as important things to to uh, to have a long and happy career. Well, wonderful. Well, thank you all for being with us tonight. If any of our participants think that anyone they know might benefit from this webinar or from others that we've done, that will be available at the Music for All website. And also, we are now in a podcast form. So if you're someone who likes to listen to podcasts, this will be out and available on the platforms that you listen to those as well. Music for All's mission is to create, provide, and expand positively life-changing experiences through Music for All. Our vision is to be a catalyst to ensure that every child across America has access and opportunity to participate in active music making in his or her scholastic environment. I want to thank Michael Coomer, Colonel Tom Pommetier, and Dr. Mackie Spradley for joining us this evening. We'd also like to thank our national presenting sponsor, the Yamaha Corporation of America. Be sure to check out their educator suite at educatorsuite.com. And before we say goodnight, it's important that you understand that now more than ever, the uncertain times continue to impact organizations like Music for All, and we're extremely um, grateful, excuse me, for the donations gifted to our organization. And you can find out more information on ways to do that and if, if you support our mission through our, through our website at musicforall slash give. And finally, please join us for our next episode of Mind the Gap in two weeks, Tuesday, April 20th, 7.30 Eastern and 6.30 Central Time, where my colleague David Starnes will be leading a discussion entitled Inside the Designer Studio, Marching Band Design, Production, and Budgeting. And until then, for Music for All, I'm Susan Smith. Thank you all so much for being with us. Good night. Good night. Bye, everybody. Thanks.